Live. <laughs> is it live or is it Memorex? Well, it's good to see everybody. So tonight's show, we're largely talking about photography inspiration, how you get inspired. There's a, a great new ebook from Nicole S. Young, who happens to be here joining us tonight. Uh, but before we get into that whole discussion and we share photos and do the kind of normal stuff we do on the show, this isn't really a show. It's sort of just a hangout where I get together interesting people. We talk about stuff that's interesting to me. So something that's very interesting to me lately is this Project Loon Balloon from Google. And so especially joining us is Stephen Levy, senior writer at Wired Magazine. He's kind of a big Wired dude. Magazine? How did you get someone like that on the show, Trey? Come on. Just uh, coincidence. Yeah. It's a fluke. Personal appeal, yeah. A clerical yeah. error. Actually, wow. just thank you for the clapping. You know, just by accident, I ended up sitting by Stephen on the plane, and he had on these giant Jackie O sunglasses, and I didn't even recognize him until we got off. And then I said, "Oh my gosh, Stephen." So anyway, let's go through introductions so everyone knows who everyone is. Thomas. Just in case no one knows who you are, go for it. Yes, I am Thomas Hawk of thomashawk.com, Thomas Hawk on Google+, Plus, Thomas Hawk on Flickr, Thomas Hawk on Twitter, Thomas Hawk everywhere on the web. Just Google Thomas Hawk and you'll find me. Good I'm a photographer. You. I'm a photographer. Yes, and then some. And then some. All right, Stephen, for the few people in the world that don't know who you are, introduce you. I am Stephen Levy of uh, Wired Magazine and... Uh, author of a book, among other things, about Google in the Plex, and uh, the guy who sat next to Trey on a helicopter. Mm. That's it. That is it. Good intro. Okay, Nicole. Hey, everyone. My name is Nicole Young. Uh, go by Nicole Z all over the internet. Um, I'm an author. I'm a photographer, and I just wrote a book that's on Flatbooks right now called The Inspired Photographer, and I live in uh, California. I just moved here, Sunnyvale, so... Awesome. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to share my screen really fast just to give, it, you, give you a quick pre-show plug. Are you ready? Sure. Let me click screen share and go pick the right screen here. Where is my browser? Okay, here we go. So this is, by the way, the new flatbooks.com. You can see right up here at the top is Nicole's book, The Inspired Photographer. Check it out. You can go grab it right now. It's full of all kinds of good stuff. Um, I think it's fantastic. Okay, so let me unscreen share. We'll talk more about that later, Nicole. Okay, Gino, give us your intro. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm Gino. You can find me all over the internet at uh, GinoHawk.com, uh, on Google, GinoHawk, on uh, Flickr, GinoHawk, or uh, Gene com. I'm also uh, able to find me that way. And I'm currently working on a... Uh, an expose, Stephen. I was thinking maybe you could help me out with this on uh, Google. I don't know if you're aware of the uh, plan for Google to take over the world. They are part of the elite conspiracy. Um, this is the head of Google right here. He's taking over the world with the Illuminati. I'm exposing the whole thing. It's very dangerous. That was, that was, chapter, that was chapter five of my book. You can read about it. Oh really? Well, I'm doing I'm doing a whole book. So you you're like doing the Lord of the Rings. I'm doing the Silmarillion. I'm breaking it wide open. <laughs> I'm going all the way back, baby. But that's me. Yeah, right. Gino, Gino, and how can people find you on Stocksy? Uh, when they're on when they're on Stocksy, they're gonna have to look really hard. Yeah, there's a section called uh, you know uh, basically like deleted. Uh, it's there's a special section in hell for me with Doxy because they 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 not only invited me to join Stocksy and then saw my work and rejected it. So it's not like most people who tried to join Stocksy and they said, ah, no thanks, it's just not for us. They actually went out of their way to invite me so they could reject me. So I'm a, you know I've been disavowed so to speak. All right, so so you'll you'll go by Gino Easy there. Yeah, Gene Easy. But um, uh, I am also on Snapsation, which is the superior Stocksy. So uh, if you want to go check me out on Snapsation, you can uh, look at me. I believe it's under Awesome or Gino, either way. Uh, Thomas, I understand they'd let anybody on Snapsation. Is that correct? Mm. No, it's, it's very, very exclusive. Very oh. exclusive, Trey. Very, very exclusive. <laughs> Me and only about 10 million of my closest friends were even invited, I'll have you know. G Gino has a special uh, offer up there. For just $5, you can get a personalized boudoir setting for one hour. 
Yeah, with yes. me, I'll actually wear this stuff, so you don't even have to wear it. So, yeah, it's it's really really cool. yeah, yeah. It's kind of like a Groupon deal. He'll dress up as a cat. He's got yeah. a whole no, range no. of furry. Costumes. No, no, no. I dress up with a cat. I think you read it wrong. So anyway, yes. but yeah, lots of cool offers. Check me out, Snapstation, Gino Barasa, at whatever. Their whole web knows me, just like Thomas. Okay, so we only have Steven for about 15 more minutes. He's got to head off. He's got a real life and everything. He can just sit around and talk nonsense all night with us. Mm. Um, so we're going to pepper him with questions about Project Loon. Okay, in case no one knows what Project Loon is, it's uh, this new kind of ambitious plan by Google to launch balloons all over the world. And the way it works is they, uh, they, they launch them from the ground and then they have this mesh of balloons that kind of is always spinning around the earth bringing internet to the world. That's the plan and they've been testing it down here in New Zealand and we spent about four or five days kind of following the team around and had a great time. So he's already put out a great article on Wired.com and he has another one coming uh, with the actual magazine. You should pick off, off uh, newsstands pretty soon. Um, so we thought we'd kind of pepper him with questions because I know everyone has more and more questions the more you think about it. Um, Dave, my erstwhile Parspatu producer, yes. um, why don't you fire away first? All right, Stephen, I have a question about the balloons. Yeah. What about like international airspace and having to get clearances from all different countries? And I'm, I'm assuming it's been discussed. I don't know how much you know about it or what the hurdles are that they're expecting or not expecting or... I'd love you to expand well, on that. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I've been sort of uh, prodding them about that. You know, the, one of the reasons why they did it in New Zealand was that in the orbit they want to do, the southern uh, orbit around the Earth, it doesn't want to. It's not going to cross too many countries to go through there. You know, after it leaves uh, New Zealand, it goes to, uh, through uh, Chile and Argentina. And then it's actually going to go south of Africa there. And the next thing we have to worry about is Australia. And I think they're already well, well along in Australia. And they actually had to take down some the first balloons they did because they really didn't want to talk about the uh, project too much. They wanted to hold it as a big surprise uh, for Saturday when the Prime Minister rolled it out. So they uh, had to take down the balloons before they got to South America. They were flying faster than they thought there. Uh, but they are pretty confident that they're going to get these South American companies, countries to okay it. So they're going to be able to do at least this one uh, test orbit, this pilot orbit, to go over Australia and New Zealand and Chile and Argentina. I know Rich uh, Duvall, the, the guy uh, who thought of, uh, of the project for Google X and the uh, the guy who got it off the ground, so to speak, uh, he's he's very eager to go to Patagonia, and Patagonia, and test some people there. So uh, it, you're right; it, it is a big issue. I think that uh, it's going to be a problem if they want to go over Pakistan and some other kind of countries there. Uh, and uh, their government relations people are going to have to do a lot of work. But uh, making it public is the way they could start these discussions with people and tell them it's not a threat; it's over airspace; it's below mm -hmm. satellites, and uh, try to convince them of that and that they're not snooping on people with the NSA or anything. <laughs> so how so long can these things theoretically stay up in the air? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that they're powered solar or something so that, you know, they don't have to go up and change the batteries out. Yeah. Uh, well, they think that they can get them up routinely for over 100 days and maybe even longer, maybe even in terms of years. Uh, they cite uh, this record flight that went 744 days they think eventually they might be able to go for something like that. But even 100 days, if they have some sort of consistent way to replace balloons uh, when they go down, uh, they feel that they could deliver the connectivity there. And this really isn't connectivity like you get from your cable company there. It's generally going to be to people who don't have connectivity otherwise. So if there is a period where you know one balloon in the chain is down, uh, that's better than not having connectivity at all. So, uh, well, they, what happens when these things like start re-entering Earth's orbit? You know, I mean, where you got people in, you know, Missouri going to have a burning thing come, or Patagonia, wherever. I mean, how do they get these things? What happens after the hundred days is up? Well, they have parachutes. They can see. They have sensors in the thing, so they can see when the thing is flagging. It's not a question of power. It's a question of keeping the pressure in the balloon to keep it going there. And when you know, and it, stuff leaks out, right? The helium leaks out eventually, uh, and it, it can't go on forever. And when they sense this is going to happen, 
uh, at a certain point, which they think is favorable to you know drop the balloon, uh, they just do a little explosion there. Like, you know, they, they they release it, um, and the, the balloon can go down with a parachute. Uh, they have GPS, and they could uh, go find their balloons. They've been doing a lot of test flights in the U.S. and they seems to be going over the United States. Uh, and sometimes the people on their team can recover it, and sometimes uh, they just rely on this little message they put in there saying, this is a harmless science experiment. That's what it says there, harmless science experiment, <laughs> in big capital letters. It has a phone number that people can call uh, to get a reward if they give back the uh, electronics inside the balloon. How, how are people actually connecting? Like, how do people know how to connect to these balloons? And, like, I mean, has there been any testing and what kind of speeds people are getting with this? Yeah, well, they've been doing the first testing uh, of civilians just last week in New Zealand. Uh, and what happens is that you need a special antenna to get it at this point. So uh, they've asked some people if they mind having this antenna. It looks like, like a big red volleyball almost on a little collar uh, on, on a stick they put it uh, on their rooftops. Uh, and you know, then they send them a text message saying the balloon's within range. You can go on the Internet now uh, with your balloon. And uh, then they see if they can get it. So I know uh, on the, the little commercial, I don't, I don't know if that's the right word for it, but that, that Google put out about Project Loon. You know, it's got the nice little animation. Yeah. So it talks specifically about how African villages that have never had connectivity before can now connect. So I'm trying to, in all seriousness, I'm trying to figure out, like, how is some Bushman who's worried about, you know, Joseph Coney taking his children off and lions eating his wife, how's, how's he going to connect to the Internet even if he's got this stuff beaming down to him? iPhone. So this is one, iPhone. Yeah, so this is one scenario they outlined. Picture this. There's a solar-powered base station in the center of a village that has the antenna uh, to connect to the balloons. And then with their cell phones, you, know, you don't really, you know, uh, in these developing nations, uh, they, they generally have cell phones, uh, and the smartphones are going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, so uh, they'll be able to connect through some sort of local Wi-Fi or something uh, to this little thing in the, in the middle of the village, which is solar powered, and they'll be able to get the internet through that, and when they see the signal on, uh, they'll be able to communicate. Alright, good enough. I'm good as long as they don't fly them over Nigeria. Well, What happens there? <laughs> I'm kidding, I, I love... Nigeria is fine. Now everybody should have internet access. I think I think it's great. Why is Google doing this, Stephen? Well, so this comes out of the division of Google called Google X, which is their moonshot division. There it is, and um, and their charter is to come up with big, hairy, audacious plans that could make a difference in the world, uh, and that's the first priority. Uh, if down the road it's, it's good for Google, it's a business, well, that's even better. In this case, you can really see how it is good for Google. I mean, the more people who are connected to the Internet, they're going to search with Google. They're going to look at Google Ads. They're going to you know, be part of the Internet. And Google makes money off of people in the Internet. But I think mainly you know, the impetus, and certainly talking to the people on the team, is they're just excited about spreading the Internet to places that don't have it there. Um, what I was urging them to do was go over this house I have in the Berkshires in Massachusetts, in Otis, Massachusetts, which does not have broadband connectivity there. So I'm hoping that they could deliver uh, broadband to the wilds of uh, western Massachusetts. Yeah, it would, see, it would seem like, at least from an economic perspective, I mean, if you're targeting ads, right, you want to target ads of people that can buy things. I think, Ben, generally in this case, they're thinking, let's bring people who don't have the Internet uh, the internet, and it's going to change their lives. Um, and I think down the road you can make a business plan case for it. But at this point, they're just doing this as uh, saying, "This is really cool to do. This is something where we can advance science, change the world." And that's you know uh, part of what this division does. Uh, and a business plan is way way off. Now you can you can get internet you can get internet on the satellite right now. Is this right. faster than satellite internet? Well, it's cheaper. I mean, you right. can get cheaper, it from, but is it, fa is it faster? I mean, yeah. well, the right now, in, in the world, version, right? they say it's, it's about 3G, but they think that that could easily change. That could easily be improved uh, as they put more balloons up, as they target the different electronics there. 
a satellite, believe me, is, is, is not a good solution. It's very expensive. Um, it's pretty slow on the uptake. This is a solar-powered mesh network by balloons. So I think it's capable, actually, of, you know, theory of delivering better and certainly much, much cheaper connectivity than you get in satellites. So Thomas, it's definitely better than uh, satellites because satellites, I know your ping time is like sometimes two or 300 milliseconds. This is... This is all sub fifty second milli, sub fifty yeah, millisecond good, ping time. So, good, good much point, better. Trey. There's a latency factor. Yeah, latency. Um, hey, so uh, one thing I'm super excited about, just personally, is and I think it's great for all landscape photographers because we spend a lot of time out in the wild. I want to put one of these on my truck just so that I can get internet when I'm out in the mountains or valleys, or because there's a lot of the best places to take photos. There's absolutely no cell coverage at all, so you're just really out in the sticks. Do you yeah, take I'm some? Uh, do you take some pictures while you're out and about, Trey? I know I saw some of them. Yes, I I put them all into a uh, little Google Plus album. There, some on the blog. Uh, but my best photo, actually, uh, the very best photo I took, uh, Wired got an exclusive on it. So you're gonna have to go buy yeah. Stephen's article in Wired magazine on the newsstands, and then you'll see it printed, uh, oh. guess in all its glory. Yeah, well, that's right. Trey, Trey took out the oodles of awesome photos, but as soon as I saw this, I told my photo editor, we need this for our magazine. This is an awesome photo. And, and you know, Trey. Well, Trey, no, that, that's all well and good, Mr. Levy. Uh, but exactly what kind of cash are we talking about, Trey? I got I to gotta stick up for my guy Trey here. You're not taking advantance, right? You paid him? It's, Trey, it's did you get paid? Only, it's only exclusive window. It's a window, so we get it for that period, and then Trey could put it on, on you know, on cards and T-shirts. All right, right. You're talking in you're talking in circles. You're suspect, Levy. Trey, <laughs> I need a direct answer to this question. No, for Tony Cash, are we? No, this license. Don't don't bring it up. It's a sore subject, Gino. Don't worry right. about it. No, no but, Trey, I, I have brought it up. What kind of money are we talking about here? What did you get paid? Gino, 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 trust me. I know how these things work. Probably somewhere around eighty, ninety thousand. Let's leave it at 80, that. Eighty, ninety thousand. Is that yeah, the ballpark figure, that. Trey? I, I think, listen, there's a lot of people in the chat room that want to know. I'm seeing it. It's like, like 50, 60 people. How much money did Trey get? So this isn't just me. This is obviously It's not about money. So it's about no. this is a wonderful new technology, yeah. and it's interesting. Are we going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya? Are we going to talk about how much we're, cash we're, we got? We're linking it to Google Plus. Yeah, pluses on, on the, yeah, like, yeah. So oh, that's great. So Trey, people, you can pay your bills with that. People, yeah, put pluses on it, and his fee goes up. All right. Yeah, well. no, don't, uh, I like, uh, I like Stephen. I'm honored to be sitting there beside his article. I think it'll be cool. And this, for people who really want, in this particular case, it was a, a grand total of zero dollars. Apparently, I'm the unpaid staff photographer for Wired Magazine, uh, but um, it's not, uh, it's not the end of the world. No, no, what's, no, wait a minute. There's a bad message going out here in the free market. Google's sending out internet to Africa for free. Trey's giving away pictures for free. I mean, come on. The little guy out here cannot have this. You, people need to start forking out some cash. That's all I'm I'm done with the topic. Don't worry about it, Gino. It's all good. I'm a little upset about that, but that's all right. <laughs> what are you drinking there? Just drink more of that. Yeah, I'll just keep... Uh, Hitting the, the crown black. We'll be right in a minute. <laughs> hey, Stephen, right, so, is it true that you're related to uh, Elvis Costello? You look just like him. Uh, I met him. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Uh, yeah I, met I love him. him. I, I Believe it or not, he played at a friend's birthday party. Yeah, that happens all the time. A lot of my friends have him over, so I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Uh, so... Stephen, this article you're writing for Wired is going to be uh, different than the one you already published online, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I had to. You know, I I really wanted to get something online. Um, you know, when it came out, and I, you know, I uh, wrote you know like a little account, mainly focusing on the New Zealand thing. But I'm going to dive a little deeper into the science and the history of the project uh, in Wired. It'll be uh, we have a long lead time. It'll be in our September issue, which is out in August there. Um, but it'll especially be great because your photos in it. All right. Well, we'll see. All right. Exciting. Well, thank you, uh, Steve. You can pop out now. I know you got real life well, to attend to. I've been flying for two days getting back from New Zealand, so I've got a crash. Yeah, it's but, a uh, long. It was, it was great meeting you. You know, that, that I, I told Trey, 
you know, uh, a friend of mine, actually from Google, said, "Oh, you're going to New Zealand. You've got to meet this guy, Trey. You know, he's a friend of mine." I said, "I'm going to find to meet this guy. I'm going to go to the wilderness. We're going to launch balloons. We're going to hang out with the team there." And then I'm sitting next to him on the helicopter. That, that's the guy. Wow. Yeah, so great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give you an adjunct funny story. So I emailed my uh, my COO, Curtis Simmons, and it was the middle of the night when he got it. And he go. I said, "Hey, I, I'm sitting here by um, by uh, Stephen Levy," and he goes, "That's random." And then he woke up the next day and he goes, "Man, it was the middle of the night. I thought you said that you were sitting by you." See, look, here's Mr. Elvis Costello. Then this just this is like this is like Stephen in high school right here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, good to see you, Stephen. Um, I'll catch okay. you next time. Thanks a lot. This, this is great. Um, so no, I'm not jet lagged. I'd love to come back. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, best of all of you. Nice to meet you. All right. Nice to meet you. Right. Nice to meet you. Bye. 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 He's a cool guy. We met the first time about two years ago. We both uh, were speakers at the called the EG in Monterey. And, uh, uh, yeah, he's, um, he's a cool guy. Smart guy. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, we're going to have to change. From the life of Riley to the life of Trey. It's just too. He's like, I love Trey. He's just like, yeah, I had him one time. Me and the Queen were having lunch, and um, <laughs> we're thinking about Bob's and he was there. So, <laughs> well, that's not exactly. But okay, let's change the subject to uh, Nicole and her inspirational evening. So, for everyone watching, and uh, we're watching the chat room and everything. By, by, I saw a question on there about how high they. The balloons go, they go about 20 kilometers. But keep the question going in. Me and Gino and Dave are watching them. So um, the project tonight is about inspiration and photography and how do you get inspired, how do you get ideas, what kind of keeps you going. So I ask everyone here to bring a few examples of uh, you know, things they go through, thought processes or things um, they consider when they're like maybe in a rut and they want to be inspired and try something new. But I thought probably the best person to start us off would be you, Nicole, because you sure. just wrote a book about this whole subject, so surely you are uh, the foremost world's expert on this. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say the world's expert, but um, I did have a lot of time to think about it. <laughs> so, you know, you know, it's funny because uh, I've been, the topic of inspiration has really been a really big one for me the last year. I mean, you know, we all know what inspiration is. We're all inspired by certain things. But it's really been... <laughs> I've been involved a lot with On One Software and their big pushes, inspiration, and then um, even just the last, even just the last couple of days. Uh, I just moved. I got here about two weeks ago, and in California. And I moved down from Portland, Oregon, and I've been kind of, you know, whenever you move, you're in limbo. And so I, behind me, I have my whole food photography studio, but it's not set up yet. It still has a lot of, I still have a lot of unpacking to do. I've been reading a lot of um, magazines, and that's one of the things that one big way that really inspires me, especially for my food photography. When I look through cookbooks or uh, magazines that are about food, I see something and it sparks. Just um, I'm itching to just go shopping and grab some food and put it together and photograph. Um, so are you, you know, on, that's, uh, are you on Pinterest? Yeah, yeah, I'm on Do Pinterest. You... Well, when you mention magazines, do you do you find you get more inspired from magazines or like Pinterest? Because I find Pinterest, I get more ideas per second than I do flipping through a magazine. You know, I do. I use Pinterest a lot, and actually, um, well, a little bit of both. You know, it depends on what I'm looking for. If I'm looking for ideas for my house, you know, we just moved into we're renting, but we just moved into a place, and we were able to paint all the walls. And I'll, I'll kind of angle up. I don't know if you can see that really beautiful teal color. Um, actually, I found that in a magazine. <laughs> Go back to the magazine. But I found a lot of the other colors, ideas, and kind of inspirations from um, looking at Pinterest. I do. I love Pinterest. They have really great mobile apps. You know, I just like swipe through things and uh, search for things. What's your Pinterest? I'll pull it up here. Um, I think it's. Uh, I think it's Nicolzi's store. Nicolzi store. The, yeah, because yeah. Nicole, someone took Nicolzi. Colsey's. And I've, I also use it for my, I have an online store where I sell presets. There it is. Yeah, that's me. Look at that. I, I followed you. So I've followed all of your boards. Yay. Which board should we show people here? Where they oh, gosh. Get... I don't know. Uh, I, I have, let's, let's find one that's not just a self-promotional one. There's got to be, I, I post things 
Go to inspiration, food styling, and photography. That's probably a good one. one. The cannabis it's on the, it's the second one. Inspiration, row. food styling. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, haven't, I don't know if I've posted to that in a really long time, but I see little things, and it just it doesn't, you know, it's, I'm not looking at things to say, I want to create that exact photograph, but I'll see something and go, oh, my gosh, I love the way that they used those coffee ice cubes, for example, or... Uh, what else is in there? Um, the colors that are used in certain things are like that black one with the cherries, the way that it's very dark and rustic. You know, it just, mm. it just kind of, inspiration can come from anywhere. I've been going on a lot of walks with my dogs and I try to kind of keep it uh, digital free where I'm, I'm not on, trying to be on, I'm trying not to be on my phone too much unless I'm taking a picture or, you know, someone calls me or something and I just, you know, a quick phone call. But I try to let myself absorb everything around me because you never know where, like, you might see one little thing that makes you go, oh. <laughs> and then when those happen, then you use something like Evernote or Pinterest and you jot it down and you save it for later. I have a list application called Wonderlist. And, I mean, I have so many lists started on that. But every time I come up with something, every time something piques my interest or I get inspired by something, I write it down. So that way I have it there. And then I, I go through that list and going through that list inspires me to do other things. So it's kind of this like cyclical thing. So. Uh, Thomas, how about yeah. you? Yeah, I get inspiration from a lot of different places. Um, you know, I think um, I'm not beyond, I don't want to say stealing because that sounds kind of seedy, but getting ideas uh, largely from other photographers. Um, my, a lot of the work that I do is about going to different places in America and photographing them. And who better to show me what to photograph in a particular region than someone that lives there and shoots there and does all kinds of interesting stuff. So I'm constantly scouring Flickr. Um, I've got, um, I don't know, 150,000 Flickr favorites or something at this point. But I'm constantly looking for different things that interest me. And a lot of it's just not even so much. I mean, some of it I just like it because it's art and it inspires me. A lot of it's just trying to figure out what I'm going to shoot when I go someplace. And um, so I, I do that a lot. Um, I find from a style standpoint, um, I really like to watch what the young kids are doing. You know, there's a lot of, on Flickr especially, there's a lot of like these like little 20-year-old types that are just really kind of doing interesting new things. And I like to stay fresh and kind of look at styles and where people are going. And, and I love books, photo books. Um, William Eggleston, Everybody Drink for Will. William. <laughs> you know, take a shot. There you go, Gino. Uh, Eggleston, you know, I, I get books and I get photo books and uh, a lot of the great masters, whether it's, you know, someone like Eggleston or Robert Frank or Lee Freelander or somebody who I really admire and I kind of dig into their work, you know, Gary Winogrand and just kind of get photography books and just pour through them. And, uh, and that's inspiring to me. But, I, you know, I find inspiration everywhere, from the web, from books, from other photographers, uh, from, you know, if I want to go to a city, I'll pull up that city on Flickr and sort of by interestingness and just spend seven hours pouring through, you know, 10,000 photographs. Yeah, I'll give a few examples of uh, what I do um, for inspiration. I'm big on Pinterest. I guess that's why I brought it up so quickly. Let me jump over to my pins. Here are my pins. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, my pen's here. So I've got a bunch of different boards, and one of my favorites, this is the one that I pin to by far the most often, is uh, design ideas and inspiration. And I'm constantly pinning stuff to this. I just get um, all kinds of crazy ideas, and I'm always uh, inspired by these ones that actually look like mistakes. Like I look at it, I'm like, what's going on? And then I look at it closer, I'm like, oh, very clever. I think, hmm, you know, and then I also think, like, could I have come up with that idea? And sometimes I th look at it and think, no, I never would have come up with that idea. Sometimes I think, well, maybe I could have come up with something like that. But then I think, like, Thomas, I look at something like this Eiffel Tower shot, I think, hmm, okay, well, I'm not going to copy that photo exactly, but I'm going to file that away. And if I'm in a, in a situation like this before, I might try something similar to it. So, I yeah, just I see all kinds of... I just outright steal the shots. <laughs> yeah. Well, what did they say in the movie Swingers? Every everything's derivative, right? right. Yeah. Great, great, great art. Good artist copy. Great artist steal. Yeah. 
right? Like this is a good idea. I've never actually seen this executed so well. Um, simple idea, looks like fun. Got to try. I saw I saw a similar shot with that with Mount Kilimanjaro. Somebody had a wine glass, and Mount Kilimanjaro was in the distance, and it was you know reflecting through their wine glass. It was almost exactly like that, only with the mountain in the background. I'd like that shot a lot better without the watermark, though. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I, I really like. I see a lot of this stuff on Pinterest. These things with like looking through wet windows. I think they're always Very so cool. I'm trying to figure out why I like them so much. Because well, it's because they look like impressionists, and you like that. Yeah, I guess yeah. they look like paintings. That's true. It's it's a return to pictorialism. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, this is uh, so that's kind of one suggestion. Jump on Pinterest and follow a bunch of people and get ideas. Uh, another one. Let me sh share a different screen here. I'm going to share my uh, my iPhoto here. Is to go to places uh, that you wouldn't normally go, like um, like put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. Like you know, you have every day choices between the known and the unknown. I think people get used to choosing the known, but I would say about 75% of the time I choose the unknown, especially for photography. So this is. Um, these are a few things that you'll see if you go to someplace totally unknown like Burning Man and usually actually a, a week at Burning Man inspires me for about a whole year just because I end up getting so many photos and I see so many strange things in strange lighting conditions so I'm sharing a few photos here that I've never really shared before I don't think I've got you know thousands of photos of Burning Man that's Ben Wilmore he goes to Burning Man almost every year I think but it's just full of crazy stuff, and it's nice because you can kind of take photos of, of anything, and uh, people are cool, and uh, it's not really exhibitionist, but people are just very comfortable with their own sense of self-expression. And so you can really experiment and get ideas, and sometimes your photos come out totally different than you expect, and it just, it just gives you ideas for a whole year. You know, you can really... Like I experiment a lot with my styles here and come up with different things and it's just nice to uh, you know try wild filters and take pictures of people in weird lighting conditions. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's sort of a, let me unscreen share here, that's sort of a, a meta level suggestion about uh, you know getting inspiration is just go do something that you wouldn't normally do and try to squeeze some good photos out of it. Maybe you will or maybe you won't, but uh, either way, I think you'll come away inspired with some good ideas. Mm. Um, hey, Nicole and Thomas and Gino, yes. what do, you, do you guys think there's a difference between, sometimes when people talk about inspiration, I always wonder if they're wondering about motivation. So do you it's think so there's funny. a difference between so inspiration funny. and motivation? Yeah, it's so funny you said that because probably like two hours ago I had the topic in my head and I, I, was, I was cleaning up my office because I was motivated to clean it for the hangout. And yeah. then I was like, oh, motivation, you know, and people might get that mixed up. And I think there's a complete difference between the two. It, motivation is, there's like, you can be motivated by money. You're motivated to attain something as opposed to just being inspired maybe to create something or just inspired to be a certain way. Uh, they can kind of go hand in hand. You can be have be motivated and inspired at the same time, but I think they're different. I, I definitely think they're different. Yeah, I think inspiration can motivate, basically. Yeah, there you go. Well, I think kind of sticking with what you were saying there about how you can be motivated by money. Um, you know, I, I have a family. I'm the sole provider. You know, I got lots of bills to pay, house and all kinds of stuff. So during the day, I am focused on my other business where I have to make a living and so sometimes it's hard for me to get in the mindset of creativity because I'm stuck in this monetary thinking that I'm in in the day so how I get there is usually through music so I'll, I'll pick an album usually if I want to go shoot and I really just don't even have a concept normally I do have a concept I'm, I want to go get this but if I'm kind of in a rut and I'm thinking I really want to go shoot something, I just don't feel like it. I'll pick an album like like this one. I use a lot. This is Traffic. It's an old album called The Low Spark of High Heeled Boys. Steve so, Winwood, right? Steve, that's right. Steve Winwood, and that that particular song, The Low Spark of High Heeled, it's very jazzy fusion song. And I'll sit there and listen to it and not try to be moved, but just let the music uh, inform an idea. 
And I'll usually then, that'll get me out of thinking about business and into thinking about being creative. So uh, also sometimes I'll use album art. Like this is the inside of the Joshua Tree. If you ever uh, bought the Joshua Tree album by U2, this is a picture right here. Um, and and there um, somewhere I don't know where that is, but I'm we're going to we're going to go to Big Ben, and because of this picture, me and some friends, I saw this picture when I bought the album recently, and I thought, you know what, I want to go to Big Bend and do some shots like this out in the desert, and um, sometimes I'll just think, you know, thoughts about uh, Brian Matias. That usually some of my best stuff comes out of that, you know. So whatever, I but usually me. What I'm looking for. Gina. Yeah. But usually music. I'll try, I'll find an album that I want to listen to, and I'll just start listening to it, and I'll get some inspiration, and I'll go try to, to take some images that fit that mindset to me. And that usually has to do with more with processing, too. When I'm processing images, the music will inform which direction I go with the processing. And speaking of Matias, look who has magically <laughs> appeared in the center square. Hello, Brian. What's going on? Hey, Brian. Hey Thomas. Oh, the mic. Should be on the other side. Be on the other side. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Tell them what to do, Nicole. Hey, How's so, uh, do you have any golden nuggets of truth to drop down on us, like beads of ambrosia from Mount Olympus above, about inspiration, Mr. Matias? Inspiration. Oh man. Um, uh, well, like in terms of photography, yeah. Uh, like a lot of times, what I'll do is. Uh, I, I heard Thomas talking about looking through books, um, yeah. <clears throat> and I don't really. Sorry, Kodak's going nuts. Um, I'll, a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll just uh, go through. Um, I'll use Pinterest and I'll use um, Google Plus, and I have certain circles that I follow that I've curated. Uh, just that, especially like communities that have a uh, high end, high end uh, processing, because that's what inspires me. It's like when I see. Um, uh, a lot of times the inspiration I need is not necessarily when I'm out in the field. It's when I'm in front of the computer and I'm just trying to think of something to do with the image. Um, and so when I see uh, a concept, like today I saw, uh, I reshared a photo on the Google Plus Photos page of this guy, uh, a, a model shoot he did. And the way he did the color grading is very uh, Ibarra-esque. Um, and it just got me, my mind, to like totally racing uh, over the ideas of what you can do with color grading, which is something that I haven't explored much. I'm really excited to because actually Jaime is going to be coming to campus to do a workshop in a, I don't know, a couple weeks. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that gets me inspired. Is, is like seeing the the specifically the post processing tech. That's the shot right there. Uh, just scroll down for a second, because the, the, there it is. The way the dress goes into the corner, like, what a fantastic, like, concept of leading lines. I saw that, and I, I stopped streaming, and I made it the photo of the day. Um, and the dude has... very like, Ibarra-esque. Hey, that'll be big if uh, Hayame comes to, to the campus. Um, is yeah. this going to be... Is this going to be open to the world, or is it just open to uh, Googlers? The workshop itself is, is only for Googlers, um, as far as I know. And uh, he's coming to give a presentation. So whenever we have a photographer present, Trey, as you might know, it gets recorded and then it gets put onto our uh, talks page on YouTube. So I'm sure his will go up there too. Awesome. Yeah, you guys have a good time with that guy. He's awesome. I'm what is that a dog? What's going on? Yeah, with that, that, that piece of carpet <laughs> behind you is going to have puppies in a couple of months. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it this isn't a new thing. <laughs> Let's start that way. I just got a what? brand new pair of Chucks yes, or two days ago. And as soon as I walked in today, he just walked in and, and peed on him. Peed on him. Just behind there. It was off camera right. a little bit. I, I, th I think he's in love with that bed or whatever he's playing around with. Oh, it's a, he's got amorous feelings for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now the bed's on my legs and he's on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I don't mean to derail. This is going to be banned on YouTube soon. <laughs> yeah. How should I tag that video on YouTube? <laughs> Just blur out that section of my screen. Yeah. Right here again. <laughs> no, actually, it'll be weird because you're just going to have to pixelate the whole bottom half of Brian's body. <laughs> Trey Hangout number 78, a.k.a. Doggy Style. <laughs> Whoa. 
Oh, All right, hey, uh, Gino and Dave, are you guys watching the chat room? Any questions rolling in from those guys? Hey, what yeah, they still want to know how much money you're making. Uh, ever, no, 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 go ahead. They, they yeah. want to know, they're, they're happy that Gino's a crown man. That's right. That's yeah, what, one other thing for inspiration is I love going to art museums. I just, you know, I, I hang out there and you'll see a photographic retrospective that somebody's doing or just even just paintings. I mean, I find, Trey, like you, I know you're inspired by the Impressionists. You know, I'll go there and I'll say, oh, wow, look at that Rothko, and how can I create my own Rothko in the camera, you know? Well, it's, it can, one thing is that's easy in a bad way for us to do as photographers, especially if we're sitting at our computer most of the day or spending time with other photographers or going shooting with other photographers, is that we need to remember we need to step away, not necessarily from the photographers, but from that mentality and go to museums or go to some strange science exhibit, you know, or just kind of step away from photography for a little while because it's obviously it's good to look at photographs, but it's also good to make open your mind to other things and not just t have tunnel vision for the same medium, you know, all day in and day out. Yeah, I think that's a, a good, good point. I've got to give a speech at this place in Auckland in a few months, and it might be the last time I'm ever invited to give a speech here because I'm going to say something they probably won't like. It's this organization called NZIPP, the New Zealand Institute of Professional Photographers, uh, an esteemed organization of which I'm a member. And anyway, uh, what happens at this, these meetings uh, that they have every year is they have these uh, competitions or these uh, uh, things where you submit your photos into different categories and they get judged by other NZIPP judges. And, uh, you know, it's actually quite expensive. You have to pay like $50 to submit a photo. And then, you know, really in order to get qualified or whatever, you need to submit a certain number of photos to get a certain number of awards like bronze, silver, gold. And, and so you can submit like 10 photos. Some, some people spend like $500 uh, to submit photos. And so they go in and people judge these photos and so on and so forth. And they get really caught up in what all these other photographers think about their photos and they're looking at all the other winners and this sort of thing. So I think it speaks to that thing Nicole was just saying where if you don't watch out, you can accidentally get obsessed with what your group is thinking and doing and that can over influence you or over inspire you to go down a certain path. Um, now I don't think that's the way it is with everybody inside NZIPP, but I can see how it can easily be a trap for people to, uh, to care too much about it or to be overly inspired by a, a small little ball of, you know, have you ever seen snakes mating? Just, you know, it's a mess. So that's what I think of sometimes. Sounds hot. <laughs> Gino, are you familiar with this concept? Um, you know, actually, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, when you start, this whole uh, animal love theme going on tonight, it's, it's getting carried away, so. Well, we went from, you know, mammalian love to reptilian love. So, ah, yes. Yeah. Monoped to no ped. No, actually quadruped, excuse me. Yeah. All right, well, you guys have anything else to say on inspiration before we jump into um, show and tell time? There's a question. Question. I'm reading it right now from Rich, Karst Rich Karstensen. Question, I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, and I got really bummed out this winter. Oh, uh -huh. I like to shoot storms slash landscapes, etc., and everything is dead, no color. We had a long winter and nothing to shoot. How do you find inspiration in this situation? I have no lighting equipment, flashes, for indoor work. I, uh, I actually... Well, I, uh, oh, go ahead, Gino. Oh, I was going to say, look, we're all ready to jump in. I was just <laughs> thinking about this myself. We went uh, camping recently to a, a park that I knew uh, uh, was not going to have a whole lot to shoot at because of forest fires that have gone through recently. So I was thinking, well, what am I going to shoot? So I, what I found whenever I'm like, ah, I'm kind of in an area where there's just not a whole lot going on is I go macro. And you can go small and find there's a whole little world going down in the small world. And that you can find all kinds of fascinating, interesting things when you go tiny. Because we're usually looking big, things that are our size or bigger that catch our attention. But if you'll stop and just you know, look around at, at really small things, even things like uh, you can go to a junkyard, you know, and find old, uh, you know, car badging and stuff like that. There's all kinds of little bitty small details that we don't look at most of the time that I find uh, can be just as fascinating if you run out of big things to shoot. You know, I'm from Nebraska. I'm actually from Lincoln. 
And uh, last year, Brian and I went to visit my family. And because I've been away from home since 1999 and just go back to visit, now that I'm a photographer and I shoot landscapes, I was really excited to go back because there is so much beauty in the cornfields of Nebraska that I didn't see when I lived there because I just kind of had, I became blind to it. You know, when you, when you see the same thing over and over and over, especially I don't know how long uh, Rich has been living in Nebraska, but if he's lived there his whole life, then he's prob he probably knows what I'm talking about. And that goes for anywhere you live. You know, you can become, I'm sure, Trey, maybe, maybe you won't, it's New Zealand, but maybe in 10 or 20 years, you'll be like, ah, this is boring. I've shot this already. You know, or it's, it's just, you know, you've seen the same thing over and over, so you kind of start to lose, um, you kind of lose sight of what actually is in front of you. And, I mean, I've lived in some amazingly beautiful places. And, you know, since I, part of it was luck, part of it was by choice. But I was so excited to go back to Nebraska and, and discover these new places. And I used things like uh, the Stuck on Earth app is actually really good. Uh, you can find, if you're into doing... Uh, any kind of, you know, you can find a lot of cool abandoned buildings out just driving into the small towns, uh, just walking around in a town, uh, a little tiny town out in the middle of nowhere, you know, you could find some really cool things to shoot. So there's obviously stuff out there. Oh, and if you're into storm photography, when I was 17, that was my favorite thing to do in the summertime, about this time of year, was to run out with my camera. Anytime I saw a little flicker of lightning off in the distance, scared the hell out of my mom, but I got a few good shots out of it. And um, and that was back, you know, it was like oh, 15 years ago or something like that. So, um, and I wish I could do that. I haven't lived anywhere where there's beautiful storms. And actually ties in with my uh, share for later on in the show. But, yeah, there's there are things. Anywhere you live, there's something beautiful. So, just, you know, you just kind of have to keep your mind open to it. Sorry, that was a rant. <laughs> no. Good answers, Nicole and Jim. <laughs> All right, we can share our photos now. Uh, Thomas, you want to go first? Ah, oh, sharing some photos. All right, I'll share some photos. Uh, let's see here. Screen share. It looks like you got a haircut, by the way. You're looking sharp. Thank you. Yeah, you look like you could be a uh, air marshal. Oh, okay. Well, I'm thinking about joining the National Guard, so good thing you said that. Alice Kla, how come is that? Uh, so just some shots. These are just some shots that I've taken for a while. More and more, I've been working old shots. So I've just been taking old things that I've shot over the past 10 years and just kind of kind of reprocessing them with a fresh eye and, and modern tools, you know. Is that Mrs. TH? Because if it is, you need to stop referring to this as a picture of an old thing. Uh, oh, yeah. No, it is. It is the Mrs. Yes, right. it is. Who's, who's right. in the chat room tonight? So I figured why yes. not share a photo of her since she's chatting with us all. Yes. Uh, this is, uh, it, you know, no, but what I found, what I think, one of the things that I think is interesting is I think sometimes we forget to go back. We, we forget how much the tools have advanced in the last five years. And all of this, the different software, whether it's Lightroom or effects packages or Photoshop or whatever, Nick, you know, all of these software packages have evolved and have have progressed so much in the last five years so I like to go back and see what I can do with a lot of uh, my older photographs uh, of a very young uh, Mrs. TH so th uh, this is a photo I took of my wife in the um, Seattle Central Library which I love libraries because they can't tell you not to take photos there or throw you out and you can kind of use the architecture to your advantage and there was a floor and a reflection, and I love abstraction, and so she's modeling for me. She's off to do, and um, so this is something I reworked recently and uh, kind of played around with the contrast a little bit and did different things. Um, here's a photo I took of a mannequin. I love to shoot mannequins. I have about probably 5,000 photographs of mannequins at this point. The ones at Neiman Marcus are the best. They do in Saks and uh, no, not Saks. Uh, where is it? Uh, uh, now I'm even forgetting the designer. It's not Saks. It's uh, it's somebody I can't remember. Somewhat, somewhat, somewhat Anyways, creepy, something. but all right. Yeah, but you know, it's a little creepy. It's got the big ears. The thing I like about mannequins sort of, is uh, their complexion's always perfect. It is. Yeah. It is. They they you know they and and plus they don't complain when you yeah. shoot them. You never have to look at the picture and go, oh, your eyes were closed. Let's do that again. Right. 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 So 
Um, this is a photograph um, of a Neiman Marcus mannequin. This is um, I love other artists' work. I mean, I love I love reinterpreting what other artists do. So this is um, this is a photograph uh, of a painting by Chuck Close, the artist Chuck Close. Some of you may know him. And what I did with this, first of all, this was a sort of a private painting. Uh, Don Fisher, uh, rest in peace, who's now no longer with us, who founded the Gap, had this sort of private gallery where he where he held his personal private collection. So this photograph, uh, this particular painting by Chuck Close isn't as widely seen as a lot of his other stuff. And I got into this gallery and I was able to take a photograph of it. And then I thought, you know, it looks a lot better as a mirror image than as the way Chuck originally painted it. So I split it down the middle and did a perfect mirror reflection uh, of a painting by Chuck Close. And uh, I'm a big fan of appropriation art. Uh, here's a photograph of Graceland, Elvis Presley, that I recently redid. I warmed it up quite a bit, added a lot more yellow tones. And, uh, of course, William Eggleston, Gino, take a drink there if you're uh, – what are you drinking, Gino? Crown oil. Black. Crown oil. All right, so uh, Eggleston, um, he did a whole book on photos on Graceland. So I shot Graceland in Memphis a few years back. It's a wonderful place. Here's a photograph. The last time Trey came and visited me, I had him put on a costume. And we dressed <laughs> up. Those are, I, I just call them pajamas, Thomas. Right. Pajamas. This is what Trey sleeps in at night. And, uh, you know, we had a little, you know, a little latex fun between the two of us. Um, <laughs> Consent adults. Consent I love adults. hyperbaric clothing. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, this is um, this is a photograph of this kind of extreme. I don't know what you call it from the Folsom Street Fair, which is extreme in and of itself. But the Gay Pride Parade is coming to San Francisco coming up, so I think I'll shoot that and get more of this sort of stuff. Um, here's a photograph from Las Vegas of a chandelier kind of just shoots at you. Again, I'm using this effect more and more, this explosion effect, where it's like, it's uh, it's this sort of fake zoom, you know? And, it looks uh, like a dandelion. I'm, yeah, it does, doesn't it? It's very abstract, and, uh, you know, again, this is an old photograph that I reworked. Originally, it did not have the zoom effect, but, you know, I went back at it and looked at it later. I'm looking straight up a chandelier at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas, and Boom, I said, that thing needs to, like, get going. It needs, like, some motion to it. So I redid that. And here's um, a photo of uh, the Fort Worth Modern, the art museum. We talked about inspiration. We talked about, uh, I mentioned I like to go to museums for inspiration. Um, I find oftentimes I'll go to a museum, and the Fort Worth Modern is a great example, and I'll spend all my time shooting all of the paintings, all of the sculptures, I'll get everything in the museum, and then I'm like really hyper turned on. You know, I'm like all fired up. I want to like make other things. So I'll shoot the architecture, I'll shoot reflections, I'll shoot abstract stuff, and I'll spend like six hours going beyond and above all the paintings and sculptures and everything. And so these are some reflections. There's a wonderful reflecting pond there in, in Texas that I shot. And so anyways, there's some stuff. Very cool. Very cool. You're getting into the reflections lately. Oh, I love reflections. I always love reflections. Yeah. Nicole, you want to go? Sure. Good. We'll go do you want me to share my? Do you want me to share my Google Plus share after? Yeah. That's okay, fine. I'll do that. I'll combine the two. Okay, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Oh, Google Plus. There we go. Okay. So this is um, this is what I think one of the last food photos that I did in Portland. Um, you know, I think as a, as a photographer, uh, you know, I, I write a lot of books. I try to give as much educational content out there as possible. I I want to be a source of inspiration for people, and it's not always an intentional thing. But I always try and do things like share my setups and um, tell people as much as I can about what I'm doing. So that's one of my food things. Um, I use the same setup to do things like this. Just these were roses from the a garden in the back of our house in Portland, so I thought I'd photograph them before they uh, before we had to leave. That's my dog. That's my Kodak. Oh. 
we um this was our favorite place to walk. I'm having like sentimental from Portland here. What I had this was, they had this great dog park out in Portland. Uh, actually, it was in Troutdale, but I would go on. These are the places that I would go on walks with him and get a lot of you know just just become inspired by little things. And I finally brought my camera once and. I tried not to bring my camera because I didn't want it to be about photography, but um, I had to document at least one time. So, oh, that's a, that's a and total that's, Kodak moment. That's a total that, Kodak. I sorry, I had to share another. He's like my little baby, right? Um, he graduated from obedience training, <laughs> so I had to get a I had to get a graduation photo of him. So. Uh, and this is kind of a being inspired by textures and macro photography. Uh, this is out at. Silver Lake State Park in um, Oregon, just kind of finding those little uh, curly, um, I can't even, <laughs> I'm trying to like draw a blank on what these are called, ferns, there we go. So, uh, going to the beach, this was in Oregon as well, long exposure. I actually became inspired to do landscape photography after I got my first ND filter. It allows you, you know, it allows you to blur water and um, just kind of make a typical landscape look a little different than what you see with your naked eye. So another, another beautiful. I loved, I loved going out and just exploring the uh, forests. And this is another one at Silver Lake uh, State, uh, Silver Falls State Park. Sorry, not Silver Lake. Hey, uh, Nicole, there's a question from Amon in the chat room asking sure. um, how to take better pictures of forest in the woods. Oh, a forest. Let's see. Well, I, you know, I took a lot on this trip out there, and I really only got maybe a couple of good ones. And the few things off the top of my head, you know, from, especially from this uh, little venture, is if you have a path, finding a path is a really good way to add a leading line and maybe a little bit of mystery into the photograph. Um, this, if you can, if you can time it so it's a foggy day or it's an area that's going to have a lot of uh, atmosphere, that's usually a good thing because then that doesn't get too lost in you know like a blank white sky off in the distance. Uh, you're going to have even tones coming in if it's cloudy and overcast. Uh, so you know, especially if you have a green, really green forest like this, then it's going to help keep the light even, and uh, and you know you get oftentimes you get uh, the, that nice glow on the edges. Actually, my husband uh, Brian has an absolutely beautiful shot from this same park, um, and uh, it's it's called the Fingerlings, and I'm not sure how to get it either. But if if you were to go to Brian Matias's site, you'd probably find it. It's one of his best photos, so in my opinion. So I hope that that helped out with his question. I would also say when you're processing not to push your greens too far uh, or yellows. Yellows usually are going to be pulling out the green color in them just because you don't want it to look too surrealistic. You want to, you know, I mean, that's just my preference, I guess. I like to keep things um, somewhat natural looking, just intensify the, you know, the effect of what I saw when I was there. So. so another, this, keep going. this is, this is one of those, uh, Stop the car when you see something cool shots, and um, it's you know sometimes you don't want to pull over, and you know, you're like, oh that was neat, and then you just keep driving, and you're like, oh maybe I should have photographed it, and I made sure that I I'm, I'm trying to really make sure that I do that. And another one in Oregon, this is at the Columbia River, River Gorge, and I think that's all. That's all I have for my photos. Very nice. Good. That's pretty okay. pretty lupins. I'm going to go ahead and, is that okay if I share my pic? Yeah, go for it. All right, let me see. I'll just go ahead and full screen this as much as possible. All right, so James Brandon is my Google Plus pick. He's actually a really good friend of mine. Um, but he's, as you can see in his cover photo here, he's been really catching my eye with some of his uh, storm photographs, which I'm are very near and dear to my heart because I just, uh, is one of the first things I remember photographing when I was a teenager. Um, I'll kind of flip through a few of them. So you can see. Wow. Him. Yeah. It's That's amazing. Just, he lives in Texas. Uh, so they're, you know, they're getting some pretty crazy stuff out there. Yeah. Great. Well, he's from Texas, so he's awesome right off the bat. <laughs> and this is like one of those moments where there wasn't the, the main event, I don't think it was right in front of him, but they still photographed and they found some really good stuff. Sorry, I don't know why it's cool. popping into a weird screen resolution there. I love, I, I love photograph. 
if you guys have ever photographed cows, you know they all kind of herd together and stare at you. It's really funny. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what they do. I don't know why. Yeah, they're all interested in. I don't James know. also has an ebook over on flatbooks.com. Yeah, he does. Tax Sharp. Yeah. Good one. Oh, he wrote Tax Sharp. Yep. That's a great one. Yeah. I love Tax Sharp. I've actually, I actually purchased that one. This is, I think, one of my favorites of his, just because that color is just ridiculous. It's beautiful. It's just crazy. It's like got to be late at night, and it's just bright blue. So, yeah. So James Brandon, I'll go back over to his page so you can see his little icon, so you can find him. So yeah. Nice Good work. Choice. Okay, Gino, go share. All right, screen share. Let's see if I can figure out how to do it. Um, let's see, folks. Can you see that? So these are more New Orleans posts. We, still um, see you, Gina. we cannot see it. You can't see the pictures. Oh, well, that's a bummer. Share that screen, I'm, I'm hoping Gina. you share this, this one photo of yours that I, I quite like, Gino. OK. We'll see if you show it. All right, can you see that? Yes. Yeah. All right, so this is, these are more from New Orleans. This is a corner of. Uh, some random place in the uh, uh, French Quarter. You can't tell them apart. They all look the same. They're old and awesome. And uh, this is Lenny Kravitz's house. You see, I don't know if you can see it in the screen, but it says Sanitary, ba uh, Sanitary Barber Shop. That was, uh, this used to be an old barber shop like 50, 60 years ago. And uh, the ruins, you can barely make out up here the barber pole painting uh, on the side. But that's uh, Lenny Kravitz's place now. Um, he's, um, he wasn't there, but, you know, it's his place. Um, some more of these haunted hotels, um, uh, they were doing Vampire Weekend when I was there, so all these tours were going by, and the guy would stop and tell you about how people have been possessed in this house and died, and just was really super creepy. Um, wow, that's pretty this, good. Yeah, and it, a lot of these shots I took in New Orleans, the night shots, they all have these light streams going by from the cars, and people said, oh, were you, you must have really been focusing on that. I'm like, no, there's just a million cars. You can't take any shot of more than a second without a car going by, so I ended up with a lot of car lights. Um, Did you see Nicolas Cage's house down there? Um, I did not see Nicolas Cage's house, I have to confess. Um for some reason, my screen just uncaptured. So, um, I'm going to try that again. Yeah, hold on. Let me see if I can get that going again. There we go. All right. So, here's one I really liked. Um, this was four seconds. And these, uh, I, you, you can tell by where I'm standing in the street that I was standing in the middle of the street. And as you can tell by the amount of car lights going around, there was quite a bit of traffic. And so I actually wanted to take this exact picture, and I had to stand there for quite a while because the cars kept stopping because of me being in the middle of the street. And uh, so I kept having to wave people by frantically to get them to keep going, and finally somebody did. Enough people went by that I got this shot. So What is that little know. blue light? Was that a blinker or something? Um, the little blue light. Oh, gosh, now Ooh. it doesn't want to go backwards. So. It was like a little blue stream, in addition to the red ones. It was like a broken well, dotted line. There, can you see that? Am I still screen sharing? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Well, there's there's lots of pedicabs. Oh. Is that what? Well, what is it? See that blue one? That little blue dotted yeah. line? Yeah. I it? think it's a, I think it's a pedicab that was going by, oh. and they cut the corners. They go over the curbs and stuff, so you can ah, see that the right. that wasn't a car because he went over the curb. Right. So um, this was uh, Jesus. He was there. And uh, made a nice appearance for everybody. Nice. Yeah, it was a big weekend, so he, I don't know, had the weekend off. But um, it's Preservation Hall. I think I might have shown some of these Preservation Hall shots. I'm not sure. Um, but you're not allowed to take pictures in Preservation Hall except for before. So that's why there's no people. They'll let you take pictures of the equipment, but you're not allowed to take this picture. So... Um, <laughs> I had my camera down on my lap, and I was just firing away as they would play, and um, they were just so amazing. I had to get a picture. You and there's rebel, lots of people. You know, you rebel. Yeah, uh, you know. What well, I mean, come on. I'm giving them free publicity, and they need it because they've only been in business 150 years. But um, there's a guy playing saw. There was quite a few of these street musicians in New Orleans all playing saw. Right. So, yeah, that's going to be a big thing in the future, I think. Or lots of saw playing. Yeah. Um, 
here's uh, this is I'm gonna I'm gonna say my uh, my discovery is not a discovery at all, but I'm gonna I'm gonna pimp up Sly Vegas. I've never heard any of us talk about Sly Vegas, and he does just amazing work. This is actually his Facebook site because he has this set from the Reggae in the Hills Fest that he was the official photographer for, and I just love this set. And so I was, I just I was talking to him yesterday and he told me, hey, go check this out. So I went and looked at it and he's just, his, his pictures from Reggae Fest were just amazing. His pictures are always kind of dark and foreboding. I love his processing. And so if you don't already know Sly Vegas, which I find very hard to believe, but if you don't, go check him out. Sly yeah, Vegas. Great work. Great work. I love that guy. Sly's cool. Yeah. Yeah, Sly yeah. is amazing, and he's also fixing a. He is the, I believe, one of, if not the, official photographer for the Warped Tour. So he is going to be off on the road on Warped Tour for the summer for like two months, doing nothing but shooting all the bands, and that is just going to be out of hand. So I hope he comes back with his mind still intact. Great photographer, great photographer, and great lady. He's got a great lady to the car. Looks great. Show enough. All right, I'll share here. Let me go uh, share thing. Okay, so um, I want to answer that uh, forest question too. I guess I'll do that. Well, maybe I'll start with doing that uh, from Amon. I've got three forest photos here. This is one thing I figured out with forest. The problem with forest is that there's a lot of trees. And, <laughs> and <laughs> when you end up, with like too many trees going into the distance, it just becomes like this muddled black um, series of vertical shapes. So I find that if you ever see like an entrance to a forest, you know, where there's like a ton of trees, it's best to go in into the forest and then shoot back out of the forest so that you have like some white uh, behind it or some light. Um, it's, I always find they're much more effective shots than shooting uh, into the forest itself. It's, it's good to have a nice white background. So here's a couple examples. That's a pro tip right there, Trey. Pro tip, yes. Uh, here's another example of that. Like there were just a ton of trees behind me. And if I had shot back in this direction, uh, then it just would have been like a mess of a forest. But here you get the idea of a ton of trees. But, um, uh, but it, it's, there's still nice contrast in there. Um, and this one plays on what Nicole was saying earlier about uh, having a path or just something to break up the uh, monotony of the trees. This is actually from the Google Plus photo walk in Yosemite that I went on just over a year ago. Oh, that was a fun time. It was a good time. All right, here's, I'll just share a few photos today. Um, here's one. Let me get rid of this. And this is taken in Sydney Harbor. There's this old uh, boat docked up there, and I thought it was really cool. So usually what I'll do, here's a like sort of HDR tip, I guess, if you're into this kind of stuff, like I am. Uh, usually what I'll do is I'll take a series of photos at low ISO that are super long shutter speeds, and I process most of the photo like that. And then this boat is you know moving around quite a bit because it's not that tightly... Um, strapped in there. So then I take another series of shots at very high ISO and I just pick out one of those raw files where the boat is still or still as possible and then I and then I process that one as an HDR then I I mask the two together into a beautiful little Frankenstein. Um, this is from a cool little walled village monastery in Normandy in France. I was there with Tom earlier this year uh, this is uh, another place in France. This is a just a little hallway that was off to the side of this chateau, and had this big map on the wall, and just they kind of jammed furniture back in here, and I just thought it was kind of cool. Uh, this is here in uh, Queenstown. This is right after you make the turn from Queenstown to Glenorchy. These uh, the mountains are just now getting capped with snow, so they're they're getting really extra pretty now. This is a um, this is from China. This is one of the old imperial barns uh, with some of the classic sort of red Chinese lanterns there, with some huge modern buildings towering behind. 
And these next two are from uh, a Disney cruise, actually. I'm about to get ready to go on the next Disney cruise in about a month or so. I'm going to do uh, Vancouver and Alaska and all those things. Uh, but here's the cool thing about this. I'm going to go back and forth between these two because this is actually the same, same bar, and they've got these really cool screens. And they that is cool. And they're video, and you can actually watch people walking around the streets and see cars driving around. It's, it's really wild the way they did it. Um, and actually, uh, there's a little hint. I don't have any close-up shots here, but you can go look in the windows and watch people walk around. And this was made by um, uh, ILM, Industrial Light and Magic. And, and wow. so a lot of it is, um, a lot of the animations you see of people walking around, they're actually like repurposed uh, Star Wars animation. So if you look <laughs> close, you can see like there's Jedis and stuff walking around. <laughs> so it's pretty That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Those pictures uh, look Trey Ratcliffian back there. I think yeah, they might I mean, be stealing your pictures, Trey. No. More, more time, more money going out the window for you. <laughs> no, nope, it's all right. Okay, so let me unscreen share there. Um, oh, oh, I should share my my discovery. Let's find it here. Where's my browser window? Here we go. This guy. Can you see this? Yep. Eric James oh. Leffler. A good oh, guy, uh, pretty photos. I don't know. I don't know if he's a good guy. Sue me. Yeah. I, I may <laughs> read too much into people's personalities. If they take good photos, I might just assume that they're good people. But it's usually the case, isn't it, Thomas? It is. He's actually a really good guy. I know him. He's local yeah. here in San Francisco. Oh, okay. But he's also a wonderful yeah. photographer, too. Did you, did you model for this one, Thomas? Is that you? Yes, yes. Yeah. That's a sheer outfit that you're streaming yes. behind you. Hey, scroll scroll up a little bit to the right. There was like a green tree just a little right there. Oh, that's pretty right there. I like that. Yeah. Working on my posture. Smart shot. <laughs> yeah, you must be. Uh, are you doing some P90X or yes. <laughs> doing some, some yoga? Keep it real. Yeah. yeah. All right, anything else? Thomas, did you have a discovery for us? Uh, yes. So, uh, my discovery. Todd Sipes. Uh, I like let me, that guy. Um, He's good. Uh, where is he at here? Hold on. Uh, here we are, right? Okay, so screen share. Todd Sipes. Not, not Todd Sisson. No, no. Sorry. Todd Sipes. Here, he does a lot of abandoned stuff. Uh, uh, Brian Matias uh, knows him and his friends. And Nicole, you probably are friends with him as well. Uh, but he does just wonderful. Oh, there's a lot of urbex stuff, a lot of abandoned stuff, just really nice stuff out there. This is an old warehouse in Richmond. I've shot this myself, but never quite as nicely as he's done here. Um, you know, a lot of process stuff. He gets out there. He does it. Skies and beautiful. Takes his time. Old factories and anyways, Todd Sipes. He's on uh, Google Plus. Check him out. So oh, that's cool. cool. Yeah, that's cool? really cool. Yeah, he does a lot of a lot of really cool stuff. So. What is that? S I P E S. Ah, ah S -I -P -E -S. what? <laughs> There's an old abandoned carcass there. You shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a very nice portrait, Brian. It's, it is a nice uh, picture. Oh, I just want to snuggle up with him there. Right, but uh, got, got got weird for a second. Sorry. <laughs> he does a lot of he does. A, I mean, I love the airbag stuff. I love getting out there and shooting that stuff myself. But he's got a lot of it. So, anyways, Todd Sipes, S I P E S. Hmm. All right. Good stuff. I dig it. I dig it. All right, anything else, y'all, before we wrap it up? Well, Trey, I have to say I am a little disappointed in you um, mm. on this show. You've uh, you've let me down with the situational talk. Um, <laughs> Thomas, thank God, mentioned Eggleston a few times, or I would have never had to take a draw a shot. But uh, right. you didn't I'm, you didn't uh, say I, situation I, once, which I, I have to believe is on purpose. So no, no. I mean, if you had me talking more circles around that wired situation. <laughs> There would have been no other word to explain <laughs> the situation. Mm. It, it certainly there is. you go. 
one. Make it up for lost time. Thank you. It's, it's one for the ages, in fact. I'll tell you the whole story mm. some other time offline. Mm. Gino. Excellent. All yeah. right. All right, guys. Well, uh, thanks, and thanks, everyone, for watching. Hope you had a good time. Uh, Great we're, time. We're back on next week, right, Dave? Sure. Why not? I'm in town, so we're good to go. We'll figure All out right. something. Number 79. All right, dude. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Nicole. All right, guys. We will uh, catch you soon, huh? All right, dudes. Do that. Do that. Cool, guys. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye. Hey, Dave. Dave, stay on. I want to ask you something, okay? Yes. All right. Oh, just